One of my absolute favorite parts about studying God's creatures is when you find ones that are doing things that they shouldn't be able to do. Like a bird that shouldn't be able to fly. Or like an insect that does something that stands in the face of evolution. It shouldn't be possible. But both of these are able to happen. Today, let's talk about the hummingbird and the butterfly. As you probably know, hummingbirds are the smallest bird in nature. And even the smallest uh, species of hummingbirds can weigh about two grams. Now, uh, a penny weighs two and a half grams. And so you can imagine holding a penny in your hand and realizing that that would be about the weight of a hummingbird. Uh, there was one time growing up, uh, we went camping every year and we had left our car windows down and we were up in the mountains uh, at, at, on vacation and a hummingbird accidentally got trapped in our van. And so we were uh, trying to open the doors but it just wasn't coming out. And so finally what we did is we, we took a blanket and we kind of put it around the hummingbird and we got the hummingbird. But as you're holding the blanket, of course you, you could not uh, you could not feel the weight of the hummingbird at all. It was just so small and so light. And we let it go out and it was just fine. But it was such an interesting uh, thing that had occurred. And of course, hummingbirds are so, so tiny, so small. Now the hummingbird's heart rate when it's just resting on a branch can be about 250 times per minute. Uh, but it is a pretty fast flyer, even for being such a small bird. And its heart rate at that point can spike upwards of about 1260 beats per minute. So very, very fast, uh, particularly when you consider our heartbeat. And you know, we, the average heartbeat is about 60 beats per minute. If we're really exerting ourselves, it can get upwards of about 200 per minute. That's just normal for the hummingbird. But of course it's very small, we would expect that. The wings on the hummingbird, of course, are very unique. When you start looking at the individual feathers on the wing, uh, in the, the center part of each feather is called the quill. But the quill on the hummingbird is extremely strong. As a matter of fact, it's so strong that for its weight and size, it's stronger than any man-made object that we have ever created. Uh, and so just by itself, the way that God has made it, uh, its quill is already stronger for its size and weight than anything that we could ever produce. And that's exactly the way that it needs to be because we know that the hummingbird is flapping its wings incredibly fast. As a matter of fact, um, the hummingbird can fly upwards of about 60 miles per hour. One of the things that they will do, it's very interesting to watch, is the female hummingbird will uh, perch itself on top of a tree or some point and the male hummingbird will begin just going up way in the air and he'll dive as fast as he can and he'll come right flying by the female, I guess, to impress her uh, with his flying abilities. Uh, but he can reach upwards of about 60 miles per hour. Now, you really gotta be flapping your wings fast to do that. And hummingbirds uh, can go upwards of about 200 times per second is how fast. And so uh, that can put a lot of strain on the wings, but of course, because they have very strong quills, it's no problem at all for this little hummingbird. But perhaps the most amazing feature of all about their wings is how they're able to fly. We know that birds flap their wings and they fly, but according to scientists, and one particular quote from a popular science article, the hummingbird is an animal that by all rights shouldn't be able to fly. You see, the motion that it's creating with its wings is one in which scientists have had a, a very difficult time figuring out how to do this and to be able to replicate it. Uh, UAV once tried to make a robotic hummingbird and the head researcher said, it was never our intention to copy what nature is, has done, it's just too daunting. What's actually happening with the hummingbird is it's moving its wings in a figure eight motion. It'll actually rotate its shoulders, so it'll flap 
and then it will turn out and flat backwards. And so it's almost accomplishing uh, two versions of lift. One when it comes forward, but then it turns its shoulders, rotates its shoulders, and it gains lift as it goes backwards. And so its wing is symmetrical so that it can get lift both ways. Um, but not only that, it's able to make very slight variations in all of its uh, wing formations so that it's able to do something that no other bird can do, which is to fly backwards. If you've ever been able to watch a hummingbird, its maneuverability is just top notch. It can go sideways, backwards, forwards. Um, it can dive down, up, it can go anywhere. Uh, I've even seen one, a couple of videos, and even just watching them as a kid, uh, where they would back up and spiraled out. Um, and just doing things that, again, no other bird is able to do because of how unique its wings are. And again, scientists are looking at this and saying, man, this thing shouldn't be able to fly, but obviously it does. It's such an amazing little guy. Not only do hummingbirds have uh, amazing wings and, and their ability to fly the way that they do, but they also have the highest metabolism of all animals. Um, hummingbirds will fly around and visit roughly a thousand flowers per day. And they actually have special eyesight that will help them to determine which flower is the right flower, which one is going to be mature enough to have nectar. So their vision is such that they can actually see some UV light that's put off from flowers when they are mature. And so they'll look around, they'll find uh, the right flowers, or they're able to kind of zero in on the, on the right flowers to be able to go and get the nectar. And of course, their beak is long and skinny, so they can get down into that flower, and they have a specialized tongue that kind of has channels in it uh, that will be able to grab as much nectar as it can per lick. And so it will go around from flower to flower, gaining as much of that nectar as it can to keep up with the energy demands. It also eats little bugs and spiders as well uh, to supplement its diet. But again, it has a supremely high metabolism. Just as a point of comparison, uh, if we were to have the same metabolism as the uh, hummingbird, what we would need to do is we would need to consume roughly 155,000 calories per day. Now, as even some top af athletes will eat around four or 5,000 calories, but if we had the hummingbird's metabolism, 155,000 calories. That would also be roughly 155 Big Macs assuming that each Big Mac was about 1,000 calories, 155 Big Macs during the day, just to try to keep up uh, with the energy demand. With such a high metabolism, it presents a problem for the hummingbird. And that is, how is it supposed to survive the night? See, if it were to survive, go through too many nights with that high of a metabolism, it would starve itself and not be able to keep up with the energy demand. Not only that, but they can't feed at night because they're missing some of the rods that would help them to have a proper night vision. So they have to go in for the night. They have to uh, turn in and they can't just feed all night. It can go for some period of time without eating. As a matter of fact, there are some uh, hummingbirds that will migrate about 4,000 miles uh, from Alaska down to Mexico. And some will fly across the uh, Gulf, of, uh, Gulf of Mexico and which will take about 18 hours. And some are able, and they're able to do that, um, but they certainly are depleting themselves of their energy reserve very quickly and won't be able to sustain that for very long. So as they're sleeping through the night, uh, if they didn't have some sort of special ability, they're quickly going to empty their reserves and they're going to starve. Well, it just so happens that the hummingbird goes into a special, uh, almost hibernation type state every night. And in this state, it will lower its heart rate. Remember, it can reach upwards of about 1260 times per minute. It will lower it to down to about 50 beats per minute. And also, its body temperature can reach upwards of 107, 107 degrees, which is no problem for it. But during this hibernation state, it will lower down to as little as 40 degrees. And so, uh, with such a, a lowered metabolism, 
uh, it doesn't consume as much energy and it's able to make it through the night without a problem. With everything functioning at such a high rate, it also has to have a specialized uh, respiratory system. You know, for most uh, mammals and most uh, animals, you inhale and then you exhale. Not so for birds. Birds actually have air sacs in their uh, system. So the way that it works, and it's, it's complicated, is when there's an inhale, it won't just go into the lungs, but it'll actually fill into several air sacs. And in those air sacs, as it inhales, it will fill those air sacs. And then as it exhales, the used air will exit out, but the air sacs will actually uh, fill up the lungs and fill up uh, the areas to where it still is needing oxygen. And so it will almost be providing a continuous supply of oxygen. So on the exhale, the air sacs provide clean oxygen. And then as it inhales, it also provides it, uh, clean oxygen, uh, fresh oxygen. And so um, it's a very, very, very efficient system that is perfectly designed to give the hummingbird all the air that it needs. And the hummingbird itself has one of the largest uh, oxygen demands for its size of any birds, which makes sense because its heart rate is up, its uh, wings are beating vigorously, and so it needs a lot of air. And so the volume that it's taking for its size is, is high uh, for any other bird. And yet, once again, no problem at all. It's able to accomplish all of this because it's designed perfectly. I like the way that Douglas Sharp kind of concluded this discussion. He said, it is unreasonable to suggest that the hummingbird developed all of these features as a product of evolution gradually over millions of years. Time and chance cannot produce such design and order. Only God can. From its specialized wings to doing things that, that uh, defy what appear to be the laws of gravity and physics, to be able to go into a hibernation state every time um, it sleeps. All of these things have to be in order for it to exist. What it tells us is that it is designed and that God created the little hummingbird. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 12 says, It is He who has made the earth by His power, who has established the world by His wisdom, and by His understanding He has stretched out the heavens. When we take a look at even something as small as the hummingbird, what we see is the power and design of God. Uh, the, the, not only that, but it talks about how the world, uh, He established the world by His wisdom. I mean, the wisdom that it takes to be able to create a bird that can fly in the way that it does, that defies our wisdom and our understanding, that is, would be so hard for us to develop. And yet, it tells something about the wisdom of God and the power of God to do everything that this little bird is able to do. What an astonishing little bird that tells us of our Creator. For thousands of years, people have been charmed by the beauty and the elegance of the butterfly. And for good reason. It is, there are so many different varieties. There are upwards of about 20,000 different species of butterflies that range from color and size and, and, and structure. And they are often just so mesmerizing and beautiful. And yet, even as uh, beautiful as they are and amazing as they are, uh, cultures have been even more inspired by their metamorphosis, how they can change from a crawling, fat, <laughs> chubby little bug into something that's able to fly. Let's take a look. To start the process, the butterfly is flying around uh, and doing all of its normal little, little things. But we start looking at the monarch butterfly, for example. When it's ready to lay eggs, it will begin looking for a place to lay its eggs. But specifically, it needs uh, something known as milkweed for its eggs. And so uh, this plant is pretty much the only plant that the, uh, caterp the monarch uh, caterpillar is able to eat. To figure out the right plant, the monarch butterfly will go around and will land on a plant and he will essentially be tasting it with his feet. He'll stomp around and get some of the juices of the plant to kind of start rising up. He'll taste the plant and he'll determine, okay, this is the, uh, uh, the milkweed plant. 
And then uh, the female will lay her eggs on the milkweed plant. And she'll lay a bunch of them around to give uh, these caterpillars the best chance of survival. And now one of the obvious dangers of laying an egg on a plant is that it falls off and then uh, the caterpillar would die. And yet uh, when the butterfly lays the egg, it actually is like nature's super glue. It will use a, a very sticky substance that will help kind of glue the egg to the plant so that it doesn't fall off even with a strong wind. No problem at all. Now the eggs themselves are very small, about the size of uh, the point of a ballpoint pen. And the, of course, the little caterpillar in there is also going to be extre extremely small. And when he's ready to hatch, he will begin to eat his own egg as his first meal. And then being on the milkweed plant, it will begin eating the milkweed uh, plant itself. Now, it's very, very small as it starts, but it's going to exponentially grow over the course of just a couple of, uh, of weeks uh, to get to its proper size. Now, what's interesting also is the fact that milkweed is poisonous. And yet, that's no problem for this caterpillar. Matter of fact, again, it's one of the only plants that it will eat. Now, this helps keep predators at bay. Um, and again, is perfect for its own survival. As the caterpillar continues to grow, what it will do is it will start forming groups of cells in various parts of its body to start to get uh, ready for the oncoming metamorphosis. And what these things are called are imaginal discs. And what they are, again, are groups of cells that are gonna be kind of the foundation for wings and the different parts of the body that it currently doesn't have. Once the caterpillar has formed enough energy, stored enough energy, it will go to the underneath side of a leaf or something like that for protection, and it will begin to form its chrysalis. It will form the chrysalis around itself, and that's where the magic truly begins to happen. Have you ever wondered what's going on on the inside of the chrysalis? Well, the first thing that happens is it starts to release an enzyme that's literally going to start breaking down and liquefying nearly its entire body. As a matter of fact, if you were to open up one of these chrysalis uh, in the midst of its transformation, it would actually start oozing out. There would be no uh, structure to it uh, like, was, like it was before. And that's because it is breaking itself down on a cellular level. And so one of the only things that, is, uh, that stays are those imaginal discs to where it's going to start using those to forming all the different parts of the body. But again, it's essentially liquefied itself inside of this chrysalis. Over the course of about 10 days, these imaginal discs and this soupy liquefied substance will begin to reform itself. Uh, things will start coming back together, will start to solidify, and all and these discs, these group of cells, will start the formation of wings and feet and all of the other parts of the body uh, that it's going to need to function as a butterfly. And of course, these are going through extremely rapid and complex growth processes, uh, going through growth spurts that are just crazy. And then after it's gone through this over the course of about 10 days, it will begin to finally emerge as the exquisite butterfly. Once it's made its way out of its chrysalis, it will begin stretching its wings and flapping its wings, sometimes even staying there for, um, you know, for a full day or so, uh, just building up the strength and getting ready to fly. And if we were to try to help that butterfly, we'd actually probably kill it uh, because again, it kind of needs the struggle to build up the strength and to get towards flying. Well, monarchs also have to get their body temperature up to about 85 degrees in order to fly. If it's colder, they'll die. And so they need the weather to actually be warm enough to be able to fly. If it's too cold, it's a death trap. And so when the upcoming winter months are approaching, they have to make a migration down south and they'll go about 3,000 miles. And they go to, particularly with the monarchs, they'll go to the exact same location as they always have. The problem is that no single butterfly of its current generation has ever done it before. 
You see, the last time that they had to make this trip was a couple of generations before. It was actually the previous year's great-grandchildren that made this migration, and then over the course of traveling and everything like that, uh, they are uh, producing several other generations. And so, no other generation has done this before, and yet again, it's no problem at all. Nobody has taught them where to go, uh, but it's already pre-built in. The butterflies will make the same migration, using the same route, going to the same location, sometimes even to the exact tree of their great-grandparents before them, because all of that information is pre-built into them. The monarch butterfly is just simply an amazing insect, as are all butterflies. And like many creatures, they pose some difficult questions for how did this animal come to exist? For example, why would the caterpillar make a cocoon? Again, if we're thinking about an evolutionary process that happens slowly over time, what that would mean is that some, at some point over the course of time, there's one little caterpillar that thought, I'll make myself a cocoon. Well, why? Why would he do that? It doesn't make any sense because he wouldn't have the capability, he wouldn't have the, the knowledge and the process of forming and, and the, the process of metamorphosis yet. And so why build a cocoon to even start with? That's odd. And then after it has mastered making the cocoon or the chrysalis around itself, how then would it be able to suddenly skip thousands if not millions of steps in a single point in time to suddenly come out as a butterfly. See, in the way that we understand evolution as it is, these type of processes take millions of years to do. And yet, what's happening inside of, of the chrysalis, the metamorphosis that's taking place, does not make any sense in the evolutionary scheme. And the reason is, is because what's taking place there, if it's incomplete at all, or it's developing the process of liquefaction, that's death. In other words, every single time it would be entering into the chrysalis, it is a death sentence. And so how would it be able to develop such a complex uh, metamorphosis of liquefying itself and coming out the other end as a butterfly? It makes no sense. Not to mention, how does it know uh, where to migrate? How is it able to go through all of uh, the different growth processes and do everything that it does just perfectly every time? It has to be because of the way that God has designed it. The only logical answer is that God designed the butterfly to be able to go through an incredibly complex metamorphosis. This is something that the butterfly shouldn't be able to do, the, the caterpillar shouldn't be able to do but it does because that's how God designed it. Such an incredible insect can only be the result of an almighty God. The God who created all creatures in this life, Genesis 1, 24 and 25. All explan other explanations just simply fall short and are insufficient. And yes, even as Christians, there is an element of faith here, but it's one that's built on on evidence, built on the, uh, all of the things that we see around us that support the Almighty Creator that we serve. As Psalm 95 in verse 6 says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. God is our Maker. God is the Maker of the hummingbird and the butterfly. And we will look at the beauty and the power and the knowledge that He has presented and displayed before us in His creation, it should blow our minds and cause us to drop to our knee and say, what a mighty God that we serve. He deserves our worship. Thank you once again for joining us for God's creatures that blow my mind. We'll see you next week.